and people are coming in. Good morning, everybody. I'm Franklin Escobedo. I'm the library of uh, the Larkspur Library Director. Um, now um, the Community Services Director. Um, welcome to our garden talks. We'll begin in a few minutes as people start coming into the room. Um, but welcome. Today's workshop, we're here with um, Bob Marcelli, and we're talking about Cal California native plants. Um, next week's um, session on citrus pruning has been canceled. Um, but the next event will be on Saturday, July 25th, and we'll be again, Marie um, Narlock will be talking about alternative lawns. And again, welcome to the library, Larkspur Library's Garden Talks. Um, this is in partnership with the Marin Master Gardeners yeah, um, and the Commons Foundation, and it's been made possible by the Friends of the Library who helped us get the Zoom. Um, if you're reading this summer, a summer reading is going on, so we're encouraging people to read. We have um, library um, is doing summer reading bingo, and um, the you can download the bingo card, and then you can also download the Beanstack app that was made possible by the Larkspur Library Foundation for um, summer reading that you can do on your phone. And then don't forget to follow us on our social media. We're um, on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Um, you can find out what's going on. We have a lot of live programming that's going on on our Facebook page. Um, we're partnered with PBS in Detroit, and we have every Friday at 5 o'clock, um, we have um, the Penny Stamp series. It's a theater series that was recorded, and it's being broadcast live on the Facebook page. Storytime is also resumed, so you can watch Storytime on Wednesdays and Friday at 11.30 with Miss Teresa. If you somehow get disconnected from today's call or you um, drop off, um, we are recording the session, so you can find it on the library's YouTube channel. For today's event, we're going to ask people, we're going to answer questions at the very end. Um, so if you have questions, please put the, your questions in the Q&A box or the chat. And um, either me or Joe Jennings will be reading the questions um, to, to Bob, who will be answering them. So again, welcome. And we'll just give it a couple more minutes for people to keep continuing to log in. And we'll get started. So. Oh, and while we're waiting here, let me, I'm always forgetting to run a poll. We're always trying to find out who is in the Marin Master Gardeners program. So if you could answer this quick question, I can get a, a feel of how many Marin Master Gardeners are out there in the audience or people who are part of the program. Um, so after today's, I'll be sending out an email as well with a survey for the Master, Marin Master Gardeners. If you're in the program, please make sure you fill the survey out because um, you do get credits for some of the workshops. Um, we also will have the links to today's recording as well as the um, upcoming event. So um, sign up fast because as you've seen, a lot of our events are, are being sold out. And what happens is we only have 100 seats in our Zoom lectures. Um, so you got to get there fast, otherwise you won't be able to get in. So and thanks for filling out the poll. And I think well, I'm going to hand this over to you, Bob. So I'm going to stop sharing. Mm. Okay. Then, yeah, it would, um, so let me introduce Bob Marcelli. Uh, Bob Marcelli has been a master gardener for more than 16 years, both here in Marin and in the Rochester, Monroe County in western New York. He and his wife, Sandy, moved to Marin in June of 2013. Bob and his wife are in a process of turning their home, home, site, um, home site into a landscape using largely native trees, shrubs, ground covers, and perennials. But Bob is no stranger to the Mediterranean climate and gardening in California, having lived twice in coastal Orange County for a total of 17 years. Like myself, who's from San Diego, lived there 26 years. Um, Bob is the co-chair of the Marin Master Gardeners Native Plants Guild and a member of the California Native Plant Society. He's a longtime birder and he has built natural habitats in all of the places he and his families have lived. So I'd like you all to welcome Bob Maselli here. He's going to teach us how to use um, native plants. So. Well, good morning uh, and welcome. Um, I am going to talk about gardening with native plants, but you should consider this 
uh, Gardening with Native Plants 101, uh, because that's what it is. Uh, I am neither a botanist nor an entomologist, um, but uh, those are topics that we will deal with very lightly. So uh, without further ado, let's continue. So what we're going to cover uh, first of all, is why we think that you should go native. Um, and we think that that's very, very important. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that. We'll talk about the Marin native plants communities. We're focused on Marin County here. Um, and we're going to talk mainly about native plants for gardens. Um, and I'll touch on that uh, a little bit. Uh, and then we're going to talk about, at a very high level, how to make a native plant garden. Um, but, but first, uh, I'd like to give you a, a word from our sponsor. I'm a master gardener. Um, there are about 350 Marin master gardeners. We're all trained volunteers. We go through a minimum of 80 hours of training. Um, and our real function uh, is to provide research-based information from UC and other appropriate organizations on home horticulture, on pest management, primarily uh, integrated pest management, and on sustainable landscape process. Um, you can reach us uh, at uh, our office. Uh, well, I'll give you some information on that at the end of this presentation. So without further ado, um, we moved here about seven years ago. Since most people in Marin County have lived here since God made little green apples, I guess I need to ask you, why should you believe anything I say about Marin native plants? And the answer to that question is desperation. Because seven years ago, actually pretty much seven years ago to this day, that's how my backyard looked. It had 10 beautiful uh, valley oak trees and 21 olive trees and about three quarters of an acre on a very steep brick uh, of weeds. So uh, when I was looking at this garden and bemoaning having left the green, beautiful um, uh, east, I was figuring, what is it I could plant on this that would actually grow? And my answer was, I think I better start thinking about native plants, the stuff that actually grew here before this house was built. So let's talk a little bit about native plants. Uh, California is an amazing, diverse uh, uh, plant home. Uh, in fact, it is unique in all the world. Uh, we have, depending on who you read, uh, six to 8,000 native plant species. Um, the California Native Plant Society, uh, of which I'm a member, thinks it's around 8,000, and I'll take their word for it because they do a lot of research on that. There are about 3,000 species of these, species and cultivars of these, in the Bay Area and about 1,600 um, in Marin County alone. But, but the real question is, what exactly is a native? Well, the overall definition of a native plant is something that was here before the European settlement. Um, and it, it, that's considered pre-native um, plant introduction. Um, uh, we don't know what the people, uh, the native people who migrated um, about 14,000 years ago brought with them. But 14,000 years is a long enough time that we'll be happy to consider that a native. So a native plant, some people say, you should only consider native plants of those things which are endemic to California. Actually, some purists say, you should only consider a native plant those things that are endemic to uh, Marin County um, or to your own watershed. But, but we have a different and a broader definition of that. Um, our focus is going to be on native plants that are grown in California 
uh, or elsewhere along the Pacific coast uh, that are suitable for landscape use. That means they're compatible with where we live. Uh, they're survivable with where we live. Uh, the garden that we would produce with them is sustainable that where we live and that they're available, that we can actually go out and buy them. Um, and none of those are trivial. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about why that's important or why that is so uh, in a bit. So why should you plant native plants? Well, my answer to that one is to help restore what has been lost and specifically to help restore the biodiversity of our environment that has been lost over the years of European uh, occupation. Uh, the situation on this is actually critical. Um, my, my little friend here is a California towhee um, and in his beak, he has the caterpillar of a white uh, line uh, sphinx moth. Um, uh, uh, when I took this picture in my backyard, I had no idea what that caterpillar was, but I did find out. Um, he is feeding his young in a nest. And in order for him to do that, um, he and his mate have to get 350 of those per day to feed them to, to uh, fledgling. Um, and they will have to feed them over about two to three weeks every day, 350 a day. The problem is, is that the source of those, the butterflies and moths are disappearing. They're disappearing due to habitat loss. They're disappearing due to, to uh, fight, uh, population decline uh, from fragmentation of habitat. And they're disappearing because home landscapes, which are mainly a, uh, planted in exotic plants that don't grow here um, or even in the United States, uh, and that actually are 92% lawn, which doesn't produce much of anything in the way of caterpillars. That's serious species loss. It's serious species loss in the terms of the number of native plant species, in the terms of the number of insect species, in the terms of birds and mammals. For example, in the last 20 years, some populations of birds, uh, about 400 species out of the 900 plus species that grow in North America have decreased uh, their populations by up to about 50%. That's serious loss. Um, and uh, the uh, insect apocalypse that is being talked about um, among gardeners and among naturalists is real also. Um, if you drive out in the country, uh, and if you did that 20 years ago when you came back in the summertime, you'd find your windshield covered with insect splats. If you do that today, it's rare that you're going to see those. So what can we do about that? Well, the thing that we have to understand is that California plant, native plants, have co-evolved through our Mediterranean climate, our topo topography, our soil, other plants that are around them, and the animals, birds, and insects that live here. That's what California's tr true landscape is. Um, and so why you want to plant native plants is to try to do in minuscule what, what establish, reestablish that kind of uh, habitat for us as people, for the plants that we want to grow, and for the wildlife that uses these plants. We want to be able to rebuild habitats, support wildlife, and create a healthier environment that in turn restores biologic diversity to our environment. 
In addition to that, we get some real benefits in the term that we can conserve water and save money and work in planting native plants. And I'll talk a little bit about why that is so a little bit, a bit in this presentation. So uh, to understand our native plants, we need to understand the places that they grow. And that differs depending upon where we live. Uh, Marin has about five key native plant communities. And what's a, what's a native plant community? A native plant community is a, um, a mixture of the specific soils, topography, climate, and so on that exists in a different place, in each different place in Marin County. Um, and there are significant differences. I live in Northern Nevada, uh, where right now the temperature is 87 degrees. And on my south facing hill, um, uh, it's probably closer to 90 to 95 degrees. Um, some of you live down in Mill Valley, where it might be cool and foggy on a day like this in normal weather. Um, so the main plant communities that live here where we live are redwood, redwood and mixed conifer forests and coastal scrub. These are primarily found in the quote fog and quote belts of Marin County. And then elsewhere, the oak, footland, oak foothill woodland, grasslands and chaparral in the warmer, drier areas. The reason this is important is that understanding where natives grow increases your chance of success in actually growing these plants and being successful in doing that. So let's talk about a little bit about uh, these communities. And the first one I'm gonna talk about is the redwood and mixed evergreen uh, fog belt forests. Um, this is a picture of a redwood forest, and you can see that it's got a low understory. Um, it's, de it's definitely got the best uh, soil um, in Marin County, and that its organic matter is better than most. Um, it's cooler, uh, tends to have more moisture, um, and the plants that grow there reflect that. We have the trees, uh, which are Douglas fir, coast redwood, and coast live oak. And then we have some of the understory plants like western sword fern, uh, redwood sorrel, and uh, one of the favorites that I keep trying to grow is California rose bay. Uh, that's almost impossible up here, um, but I have one pot that I've got a struggling rose bay in it. Um, the next one is the northern coastal scrub. This is found mainly um, along the shore in uh, West Marin and uh, along some of the uh, steeper B, uh, B Bay um, uh, shores uh, here in uh, um, uh, East Marin. Um, and this is, uh, consists of steep slopes that are uh, often um, uh, exposed to the winds and spray uh, from uh, the ocean or the bay. Um, the soil is typically a rocky or gravelly um, and uh, therefore the drainage is very good. We, we would consider the plants that grow here in northern coastal scrub as kind of soft chaparral. Uh, chaparral is kind of stiff, hard chaparral, and we'll talk about that later. So some of the plants that grow here are California sage, sagebrush, uh, black sage, cow parsnip, uh, ceanothus uh, species, uh, hedge nettle, and other um, uh, perennials that like a bit more moisture and uh, coyote brush. Um, and these plants are um, some of the basis 
of a lot of the native plants that we can grow uh, in our garden. Uh, Ceanothus um, and uh, sage uh, being uh, two of the plant families that come from the uh, uh, plant community of uh, the uh, coastal, northern coastal scrub. The next one is the Oak Foothills. That's where I live. In fact, this is what I see out of my front door. We back up to the uh, Rush Creek Open Space Preserve. That's on the right-hand side of that fence. Um, and the fence closest to you is the fence that divides my property from my neighbor's property and from the um, uh, open space. Um, but this is characterized by an open woodland. Um, and by the way, the difference between a forest and a woodland is that a forest typically has a closed canopy, whereas a woodland typically has an open canopy like you see on your screen. Um, it's typified by uh, tip very often terribly bad soil, um, uh, you know, brick-like clay in many cases, uh, but in the riparian areas, uh, it, it re the soil resembles what you might find in South Marin, for example. Uh, it's typically hotter and drier uh, than other places in Marin, um, and um, it's populated mainly by a beautiful family of oaks. Uh, valley oak, blue oak, uh, coast live oak, California black oak, uh, and, and California bay trees. These are the main plants uh, of the uh, oak woodland and foothill uh, plant community. Uh, some of the smaller plants, again, coyote bush, um, coffee berry, manzanita, um, uh, and uh, sun cup, blue dicks, uh, California buckwheat are the, among the perennial uh, plants, along with California brome grass, which in, in undisturbed areas represents one of the main um, California perennial grasses in the oak woodland. And then grassland. <clears throat> this is probably the most challenged uh, plant community um, in uh, Marin and in the rest of California. And the reason for that is that the grasslands were taken over for grazing uh, for cattle uh, and other uh, land and sheep uh, and other animals uh, by, uh, in our ranches. Um, and the perennial grasses and flowers that uh, used to be here were taken over by exotic annual grasses uh, brought in in order to feed these beasts. This is among some of the driest and hottest areas of East Marin. Uh, it becomes uh, a bit moister uh, and less hot as you go uh, westward into West Marin. Um, and this, this kind of uh, plant community uh, has as its main plants uh, grasses. Uh, the perennial grasses that grow are, are among the perennial grasses that grow are June grass, Idaho fescue, and red fescue in terms of the natives. The uh, wildflowers that grow here, California poppy, a farewell to spring, a blue-eyed grass uh, are included, uh, and other related kinds of wildflowers. Unfortunately, in most of the grassland that we can find, very few, if any, of these native grasses and wildflowers are still growing. And then finally, chaparral, or uh, as some people call it, the hard chaparral. 
you're looking at this. This is typically on steep mountainsides, um, usually uh, above uh, a couple of thousand feet. Um, and uh, the soil is well drained, often rocky and gravelly. Uh, gravelly. Um, and while the uh, sun is here, um, the temperatures tend to be a bit cooler at nighttime and a bit warmer in, in, uh, in the daytime than you find at lower elevations. Um, and uh, a lot of the plants that we grow in our gardens come from the hard chaparral, coffee berry, uh, big berry manzanita and other manzanitas, the shrubby, harder uh, ceanothus species, chemise, mountain mahogany, and scrub oak, and among the Whoops, sorry. Um, and many of these have been adapted, either natural cultivars or cultivars developed have been adapted uh, for our native plant gardens. So with that background then, let's talk about native gardens. And we're gonna talk a little bit about um, how you might do one and when you might do one. Uh, first of all, if you, whether you're doing a small, a small garden or a large garden, um, I encourage you to develop a plan. Just don't go out and buy a half a dozen plants and stick them in anywhere. So assess your site um, to what's there now and what plant community you're in. Um, think about plant choices do some layout. This is a layout uh, blueprint, uh, very small, uh, I can't even read the type, uh, of my uh, backyard native garden. Uh, think about hydrozones, think about fire ladders, uh, think about turf issues. Uh, uh, number one, do you have any? Number two, do you want any? And think about the irrigation infrastructure that you're going to need to deal with the fact that we don't get any rain for six to seven months a year. Uh, this year, we haven't had any rain so far. So in terms of your site assessment, you want to understand what plant community you're in. And a good place to find that out is uh, on Calscape. And that's www.calscape.org. That'll give you some information on specifically what your plant community is and what will grow there. You put your uh, zip code or even your address in and you'll get back a list of plants that are already growing there or might grow there. Think about what your climate is and in Marin County, since it varies a lot, what your microclimate is. Um, my neighbors down the hill from me have a slightly different microclimate than I do. Um, and, and it, you know, it varies enough that there are lots of times when I don't get um, frost, but they do. Think about your exposure. That's a south facing hill that you're looking at there. Soil pH and quality, the contours that you have to deal with, and existing plantings. I didn't have to worry too much about that when I started my garden. So here are some plant choices to think about. Uh, and these are um, things that are likely to grow in most gardens um, uh, in Marin County. Um, and uh, I believe that, uh, that um, the uh, library has a list of plants that I've put together uh, of these and can send it to you um, uh, in it. But these are uh, plants that I grow in my garden. Uh, I grow uh, McMinn, I grow Sunset, I grow Sentinel, and I grow cultivars of the three species that are in the hard uh, chaparral uh, that 
um, I uh, uh, found. Um, uh, and so these do uh, fairly well. Um, and then there are Ceanothus. And um, I grow every one of these uh, and more. In fact, my wife claims uh, that I've never met a Ceanothus I didn't like. Um, and she's right. Um, and these are my uh, passion. Uh, Ceanothus concha with its bright, bright blue. Um, uh, Ceanothus blue jeans, which is among the first that bloom. Ceanothus ray hardman, which is, can actually be a small tree. And some of the ground cover Ceanothus, mainly from the uh, coastal scrub, uh, Anchor Bay, Yankee Point, and Joyce Coulter. An Anchor Bay and Yankee Point, you know, come from the coastal scrub since that's where they grow naturally here in on the California coast. Other shrubs and small trees, coffee berry, pink flowered currant, toyon, Christmas berry, western redbud, holly leaf cherry, um, sink sink silk tassel tree, and others uh, grow well in most gardens here. Um, and in terms of perennials, uh, California fuchsia, red flowered buckwheat, yarrow, a lot of cultivars of Cleveland and other sage species, uh, alum root, which we know um, by other names, and the scarlet monkey flower. Uh, these are examples of the kinds of things that you can grow um, uh, in uh, a California native garden. And should you choose to replace some of your lawn uh, with a native garden, here are some things that will grow there as well. Uh, if you want to turn your uh, exotic lawn into a native lawn, here are three species of grass that will work. Um, low growing perennials that might replace the lawn are hummingbird sage, uh, wire grass and other gr ground covers, and low growing ground cover shrubs include Ceanothus, California uh, uh, perfume, which is a ribes, uh, and creeping barberry. But before you take this on, you really have to know the difference between uh, between what weeds look like and what your uh, re replacement looks like, because you'll do a lot of hand weeding uh, for the first couple of years until the lawn uh, until the lawn replacement actually takes place. So planting uh, in planting California natives, choose smaller plants. Um, in all the plants that I put in, uh, most of them are gallon plants. Uh, and uh, that is because uh, they establish a lot faster than the larger plants do. Uh, when you plant native plants, what they're trying to do is spread their root system. Uh, and smaller plants do that faster and better than larger plants do. You want to plant naturally but you want to consider hydrozones. And so before you ask the question, what is a hydrozone? That's a collection of plants that need the same kind of irrigation protocol. So you want to group together in a hydrozone, for example, plants that don't require a lot of water. Um, and you want to uh, group together uh, plants that do require regular watering. And you also want to think about maturity. How big does it get? Uh, because spacing is important. Um, and, and there was a book written by a woman entitled, but it was so small when I planted it. Um, and now it's a 35 foot uh, redwood in a front yard that's going to get a lot bigger. So think about that before you plant and before you choose your plants. Planting natives. They want to be planted in native soil. So don't till, don't cultivate, 
cultivate and don't fertilize it. Most native plants don't want any fertilizer. A lot of native plants, if you fertilize, you'll kill them. So when you plant, what you do is you dig a hole that's about twice the diameter of the soil ball that you've got in the plant you've got. You make sure that you measure so, or, so that the crown of the plant is about two inches above grade. If you've got a gopher problem, for some native plants, you will then want to put them in a gopher wire pot. And when you mulch, you want to keep the mulch at least three inches away from the stem or trunk of the plant. But the most important thing is you fill that hole back only with the soil you took out. I know that's counterintuitive. I know that most landscape services will want to amend that soil with up to 50% compost, and that's a really good way to kill a lot of native plants. Put back the native soil and only the native soil that you took out of the hole. The irrigation is the key to establishment. You'll probably have to irrigate for a year or two to establish native plants. And what establishment means is to get them to grow their root systems. You may not see a lot of top growth or even flowers in the first two years, but that's because if you're doing it right, most of the growth is taking place under the ground. Again, you'll want to group by similar water requirements, and when you irrigate native plants, um, you'll want to do deep but less frequent um, uh, watering. You'll put the emitter from your drip irrigation close to the crown at start because the root ball is still small. But do remember to keep stretching that out over time uh, because uh, you want to have the water out at the drip line of the plant, which is also out where the uh, feeder roots are uh, of the plant that's growing there. And you want to keep the crown clear and above grade. Uh, availability of plants is often an issue with native plants. Um, most normal garden centers carry very few. There are specialty um, uh, 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 nurseries, and as native plants become more popular, there are more and more of those. Um, but be, be flexible. If you can't get a species, use a cultivar of that species. Uh, it's similar uh, growing uh, uh, system, uh, but it may often actually be more successful in your garden than the species. Um, there's a summer culture lack. My, my native garden, large portions of it, are going into dormancy now. And so uh, I've planted about 30% of other um, um, Mediterranean climate plants from places like Australia and South Africa and uh, South America um, in order to fill in because uh, they may be blooming now where a lot of the California natives don't. And you really should expect some plant loss. Uh, my guess is on the order of about 20% uh, will not establish and you'll have to replace them. Uh, but the ones that do establish will be with you for a long time. Uh, we often get asked, are native plants a fire hazard risk? Well, uh, let me tell you, all plants will burn if the conditions are right. But not all are bad, and that's true of native plants. How we do the landscape is more important than plant choice in reducing fire hazard risk. Uh, fire smart landscaping means that you should provide defensible space around your home, uh, and you should manage pl plant placement and spacing so that it reduces fire risk. And then you should provide appropriate care, maintenance, and hydration to reduce it. 
When we talk about defensible space, you work from the house out. In the zero to five space, there should be little or no plants. Um, in the five to 30 uh, space, you should have well-spaced plants, lower in height, um, and um, 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 a, more, a little bit more hydrated. Uh, and in the extended zone, beyond 30, you can do use larger plants. Uh, you may space them a bit differently um, and a little bit more liberal uh, in that. Um, in terms of maintenance, we're trying for healthy gardens. Good basic care, good cultural practices, clean up pruning, deadheaded hydration, and IPM disease and pest control. A healthy plant is less uh, likely, a, health, a healthy, well cared for plant uh, is less likely to burn than one that has a lot of dead stuff in it, uh, is diseased and stressed. So when should you do all this? Now. Um, you ought to get planning and preparing your site now for the native plants that you're going to plant in fall and early winter. Uh, why? Because you want rain, if the Lord provideth, um, to uh, help you establish those plants on the get-go. Um, and so remember, with native plants, it's largely about spring. Uh, because if you build it, and that's what my hill looks like now, all those pictures will taken in my garden, and they will come. And all of those pictures were taken in my garden. So you can do it and you should do it. Questions? Uh, Franklin, would you like me to handle the questions? Yeah, so if people have questions, please use the Q&A box or the chat box and Bob will start reading them off to Bob, or to Joe will start reading them to Bob. <laughs> So, Bob, uh, one of the key questions about one of the key questions about fire smart landscaping is the combination of what you plant and where you plant it, but is it, it's also how you maintain it. Yes, that's really important uh, because um, uh, a plant that's allowed to overgrow or have a lot of um, dead wood in it, uh, which isn't well pruned. Um, uh, or is not taken care of is more of a fire danger than a plant that is well taken care of and well hydrated. Um, and so it's really important to set up your landscape, not only so the, the, the plants are appropriately spaced so that fire doesn't jump readily from one to another, but also so that you can get at the plants to maintain them. Um, right. There are a few spots in my garden where I have that problem right now, uh, and I am working on, you know, spacing up to correct that. Okay, and then one of our uh, listeners is interested in how to avoid sudden oak death. Uh, avoiding sudden oak death um, means that you should be ju judicious about watering during the warm weather in summer. Um, uh, most native plant or a lot of native plants don't require any water uh, during summer. Uh, but most native plants will do well with an infrequent but um, very deep watering. Um, Steve Swain, our environmental horticulturist, uh, recommends about uh, watering um, uh, one to two times a month in the months of uh, July, August, and September. Uh, and actually this year in the month of June because we had no rain for months and we've had temperatures above 90 degrees here 
for most of the month. Um, and, but watering it so that the water moisture gets down 10 to 12 inches. Um, okay. as, and, and, and that will even be the case if you have oaks, um, uh, because you want to let the soil dry out before they are ever watered again. Okay, and then there was a question on planning and designing a small backyard garden. Um, does the Native Plant Society have standard designs or ideas for plant lists that people oh. can take advantage of? Uh, they, they don't necessarily have, um, uh, they, they do have plant lists. Um, people can go to our website where we have uh, native plant lists uh, for various types of gardens. Um, I uh, have provided a list to the library that they can send to you of native plants. Sizing depends on the size of the plant. Right. Um, there, there are manzanitas, for example, and ceanothus that, that grow, you know, a foot tall and six feet wide. Um, and there are ceanothus and manzanitas that grow 10 feet tall and 10 feet wide. And so you can pick the cultivar of the plant to fit the size of your garden. And Bob, uh, uh, yeah, Tia, has written in, what native plants for a north coastal area have the most flowers and are, are the most showy and attract butterflies? Well, one of the reasons I love Ceanothus is that's, that, that's, that's one of the characteristics. Um, All right. If and then know, are there native plants that are deer resistant? There are. Um, uh, for example, Anchor Bay uh, Ceanothus is quite deer resistant because uh, it has spiny leaves um, and they really don't like those spines in their tongue. Um, and we do have uh, on our website a list of plants that are um, uh, deer resistant, many of which are natives. Okay. And then uh, Bob, in Tam Valley, a lot of the people live on Phil. Uh, it used to be a salt marsh, so the soil that's there is not natural to begin with. Uh, any thoughts on how to introduce native plants into that kind of soil? A lot of native plants will grow in that kind of soil. Um, okay. And um, the, the plants that are on the list um, that I handed out um, uh, are, uh, uh, there are, there are a lot of plants among those that probably would do well there. Uh, plus the fact there are native plants like uh, the native azalea and the native rhododendron um, and the native uh, wood ferns that will grow in that kind of soil. Very good. And then, by the way, this isn't a question, but people would like you to continue showing the pictures from your garden. They were very pretty. So if you could back up a few in the slide deck. Um, there we go. All right. Boy, that's a gorgeous garden, Bob. Um, sorry, editorial comment. Um, Faye writes in, I have a lot of succulents in my garden that I like, and my, I'm now inter interested in incorporating more native plants. Are they compatible? Well, the first thing you can do is start with native succulents like Dudleya. Um, and there are a lot of them. Uh, and so you can incorporate those if you don't already have those in there. Um, and yes, there's a lot of these native plants that will grow well um, uh, along, along with succulents. Now, is the key issue there, Bob, the level of water required? Yeah, that is, so that's, that's one of the things that you want to choose uh, plants that require less water um, because your succulents require less water. So it, it, it's got to be compatible with the hydrozone that the succulents right. have already established. So you're thinking the compatibility issue is probably mainly water? I think so. Okay. Um, I, most native plants already want better than average drainage. Um, and so you've probably provided that for succulents and um, that's, that's what you'll be going along with. 
Okay. And then, Bob, um, the, there's always this question of what exactly do you mean by deep watering? And Becker is writing in. Does that mean watering for a long time? It could. Um, uh, it, uh, uh, certainly a longer time. People who are watering, you know, I'm, I'm also co-chair of the garden walks and I go out on garden walks to talk to people about their irrigation systems. And I, I find a lot of people who are watering every other day for five minutes. That's not deep watering. That's oh, probably overwatering but it's not deep watering. What we're talking about is maybe once uh, a week for depending on what soil you have. The key is to try to get down 10 inches um, uh, to get the moisture down 10 inches because if you do that you'll be hitting the root uh, mass of about 60 percent of the root mass of most plants, and that's where you want it to be. Okay, so is that a half an hour, an hour? It depends on uh, um, uh, your soil. Uh, the way to find out is to start out at 15 to 30 minutes, and then about two to three hours uh, after you've watered, or even the next morning, uh, dig down uh, around the, uh, the um, drip line of the plant and see how deep the water has penetrated. Okay. If, it's, if it's down 10 inches, then you're okay. If it's not, then you probably need to water some more time. This is not an exact science. It's, it's you know, try, trial and error. Now, Bob, uh, Peggy writes in, what about native grasses? What, what are the maintenance requirements in terms of fire prevention? Well, um, some native grasses would like to be cut back after they flower. Um, other native grasses can't deal with that. Um, the main thing that, uh, the first thing to consider is to space them appropriately. The taller na native grasses, for example, um, uh, you know, you might, you might mass three of those together, but then put significant spacing between them and other native grasses or other plants. I, and I certainly would not plant the very tall native grasses like Muhlenbergia, um, you know, in, in close to my house. Right. Um, because, uh, so, so spacing, uh, so uh, hydration, um, these are the kinds of things that will allow you to do that. They'll do very well. Now, are there um, some native plants that are less prone to disease than others? Uh, yeah, uh, you know, and, and that varies. Um, uh, uh, and, and it also varies uh, depending on the kind of care that they get. Um, uh, but uh, the, the native plants that, that I grow have very little disease. Uh, the main problem is related to watering, uh, which can cause root and crown rot and, and or SOD. Um, the, the rest of the uh, plants seem to have uh, little or no disease. And then I've now been observing this over about six years. Okay. Um, uh, insect, uh, well, basically, that's one of the reasons you plant native plants, is so that the insects will eat them. Uh, and then the birds will come and eat their caterpillars and grubs. Uh, and then everybody will be happy. Um, and so I don't mind holes in my coffee berry plants, and the leaves of my coffee berry plants. Uh, in fact, I welcome them. So Bob, do you have a colorful native plant vine that will grow up on the fence and is deer resistant? Um, I can't talk about its deer resistance, but the native California clat clat clematis, which is called virgin bower, clematis ligustifolia, um, and it's related 
that our two other related clematis are beautiful. They're beautiful vines. They have beautiful um, white flowers uh, in mid-spring. And what's really neat is leave the seed heads on because they're very attractive and they last uh, almost through the entire summer. Very good. Now, um, Bob, are two questions that are related where should someone go to find help in designing a native plant garden? And what, what are some good native plant nurseries? Okay, so in terms of help in guiding and, and, and designing one, um, there are a number of books that you can get. I'm going to do this, uh, and I'm going to hold up. If, if you're considering native, native plants, this is a book entitled California Native Plants for the Garden by Bornstein and the Bible. Company. Uh, and it's in probably every library uh, in Marin County. And you should go get this uh, and think about uh, even if you're really getting into it, buying one of these. If you're thinking about remodeling your lawn, Reimagining the California Lawn, again, by the same team as did the previous book. Um, it's also in many of the libraries. And it, each of these have plant suggestions for different places. If you're thinking about wildlife, here's the California Wildlife Habitat Garden. Um, and then there's a book uh, by Glenn Keeter and Alby, and I can't remember her last name, called, um, well, let me get it. This book is called Designing California Gardens, and it's by Glenn Keator, K-E-A-T-O-R, and Alri, A-L-R-I-E, Middlebrook. Um, and this is in many of the libraries. And this one has specific uh, example garden designs like oh, that. Very good. Yeah, Bob. And, it, and it's done by plant community so that if you live in the Oak Woodland plant community, you'll find stuff in here. Um, first off, and then when you say our website, you mean the Marin Master Gardener website? Yes, I do. And um, then... Um, I'll, and I'll show you that later, or I can do it now, actually. Right. And it's, I don't think the Master Gardener office in Novato is open, is it? It is not open. Okay. Um, um, but, but you should be able to get on the website, number one, and you can get to the help desk by uh, email where, in fact, we are um, doing it remotely. Right. Now, in a sun and filtered light environment with the north si side of a slope, uh, what native plants work well in a shaded, filtered light, north sloping area? Um, well, there are a number of um, uh, ceanothus that will grow in that kind of area. One of them is a Ceanothus centennial. Uh, an, another is uh, Ceanothus dark star. Um, uh, in, in fact, uh, if you're, if you're uh, inland uh, in Marin, uh, they actually appreciate some partial shade. Um, uh -huh. In terms of ground covers, a uh, very pretty ground cover for dry shade um, is hummingbird sage. Uh, and uh, it, it grows very well, uh, and it has uh, red flowers that the hummingbirds love. Um, and there are uh, some of the ribes, uh, current, um, uh, and will grow uh, very nicely under oaks. There's a publication you can get online um, uh, called uh, Oak Compatible uh, plants. Uh, that's a good uh, uh, guide for plants for filtered shade. 
And then two last questions, Bob, because we're going to run out of time. Should people remove their bay trees in order to protect their oaks? Huh. Uh, well, uh, I don't, I, I can't answer that. I'm not an expert on that kind of stuff. Uh, I, part of the answer to that question is how big is it? If it's going to cost you three or $4,000 to cut down and get rid of because it's so large, I'd really think about that. Um, I, I can't answer that question. I just don't know enough. And then last question, Bob. So thinking seasonally, um, is the summer the dormant season where you sort of let things sit? When, what's the fall? Is that when you're planting and pruning? And winter is when the rains feed the plants and they'll be blooming? What's the seasonal okay, cycle so, for natives? So, so basically, uh, if, you, if, you're, if you're thinking about East Coast, their winter is uh, and spring is our spring and into the early summer. That's when the that uh, uh, that's that or uh, pardon me, late winter and early spring. Um, so uh, the plants grow um, in uh, late winter through about uh, mid to late spring. They're dormant in the summer. That's our winter. Uh, there are some plants uh, like um, uh, California fuchsia that bloom in the summer uh, and uh, the hummingbirds uh, and bees really appreciate that. Um, but but the, the planting time is in mid to late fall uh, and that with the expectation that the rains will water them in and get them starting an establishment. What, one last question, Bob, and this has been wonderful. I have had people say to me they don't like working with natives because they have shorter lifespans. What do you, what do you say to that? <laughs> what, 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 what I say to that is let's start with a native uh, plant called the California oak, seven to 800 years. Um, and we can pull back on that, that where there are manzanitas that are growing in places like um, the uh, uh, Tilden Gardens here uh, in, uh, on the East Bay that are believed to be at least 50 years old. So it all depends on what you choose and how you take care of it. And then the last question just snuck in, Dana Phillips. Um, I have a manzanita next to the house. Is it okay there or do you have a suggestion on how to move them? They're three feet tall. That's tough to move. Um, and it depends on how well you take care of it. And um, that, that, that's a really tough uh, call because you love the plant, but it's probably right now, depending on how close to the house it is, it's probably right now in the wrong place. Well, Bob, this has been fantastic. Um, if you want more information on native plants, you have information at the Marin Master Gardener site. You yeah. also showed that the California Native Society is a good source. Those are probably the two yeah. best sources and CalScape. Perfect. Um, and, and everybody who, who's attended today, I'll be sending out links to both CalScape, the Marin Master Gardeners, as well as Bob's handouts that he sent me. They were linked inside the chat boxes, but they're gigantic links. So those will be coming soon. So check your email um, this afternoon. And we'll also have links to this recording. I really want to thank Bob for, uh, for being here today. Um, and this was a great presentation um, for someone who's grown up in California. I always forget the oaks are our, one of our major native plants and they're all over the state. So um, thank you all for attending and thank you, Joe Jennings, for doing this for us. And um, again, I want you to all have a great afternoon and thank you for being here. Don't forget curbside service is available Tuesday through Saturday at the library. Just make sure you call before you come to pick your books up. So thank you again. And did you have any one last thing, Bob? I didn't want to cut you off for. Nope. Well, one thing is, somebody asked, and I didn't get to it, some places that you could buy native plants. Um, 
Mm -hmm. California flora and uh, outside of Santa Rosa is one. Uh, Amarissa Gardens in outside Santa Rosa is another. Annie's Annuals, if you want to start with four inch pots, is a good one. Uh, and there are others around. Um, so if you Google um, uh, native plants for sale, you'll get a list of native plants. Well, fantastic, Bob. Thanks so much. Everyone have a lovely summer day and hopefully you'll enjoy your native plants more every year. Thank you, Bob. Enjoy. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.